Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element Prometheum. Unfortunately, because of its radioactive nature, I don't have a live sample to show you. So, moving on. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Tao has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to go and pick up. Check out his fantastic website, PeriodicTable.com. Prometheum is the 61st element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 61 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. Here, we see the known elements in 1902. That year, Bohuslav Brauner, a Czech chemist who studied all the rare earth elements, suggested that there must be an element between element 60, neodymium, and element 62, samarium, both known at the time. There was a gap in atomic weights. Brauner corresponded with Dmitry Mendeleev, and we even have this 1905 photo of him with the inventor of the periodic table. His work eventually earned him a postage stamp, even though he never found element 61. Twelve years later, in 1914, Henry Moseley, who, having measured the atomic numbers of all the elements then known, also found that atomic number 61 was missing. In this 1922 book, written by Francis William Aston, we see the space left open for an as-yet-unknown element. By the way, Aston invented the mass spectrometer and went on to discover 212 naturally occurring isotopes for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in the same year he published this book, 1922. In 1938, during a nuclear experiment conducted at Ohio State University, physicists irradiated neodymium and praseodymium with neutrons, deuterons, and alpha particles, and produced a few radioactive nuclides, some of which was probably promethium. Because of the difficulty of separating the rare earths, and because they had so little of the produced elements to work with and their short half-lives, there was a lack of chemical proof that element 61 was produced, and the discovery was not generally recognized. Prometheum was first produced and characterized in 1945 at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee, then called the Clinton Laboratory. It was produced by the separation and analysis of the fission products of uranium fuel irradiated in a graphite reactor. That reactor is right here. Here's a close-up. This nondescript building housed the Oak Ridge Graphite Reactor. Inside, there were many ports or tubes where samples could be placed at various distances from the reactor core. Fission of the uranium atom happens when it's hit by a stray neutron. The unstable nucleus splits into two smaller, lighter nuclei and, at the same time, also releases a few additional neutrons. Those lighter nuclei can be promethium. The additional neutrons are now free to cause more uranium to fission. So the fissioning of naturally occurring uranium will create a small amount of promethium. Only one out of 73 natural fissions of uranium yields promethium. And then, as we'll see, the resulting promethium doesn't last long. What you see here is the mineral uraninite, or uranium dioxide. Wherever you find large deposits of uranium in nature, because of spontaneous fission, like we saw on the previous slide, you'll find promethium in very small quantities within the ore. Typically, only four femtograms, or four quadrillionths of a gram, of promethium per kilogram of uraninite. 
That's only about 17 million atoms of promethium per kilogram of ore. This means that only about 500 to 600 grams of naturally occurring promethium are present in the entire Earth's crust at any given time. These three, Jacob Marinsky, Larry Glendinin, and Charles Coriel, were the first to characterize the element at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and are therefore given the distinction of the discovery. Even though they did this work in 1945, they were so involved in their military-related research, they didn't report their discovery until two years later in 1947. Even they never saw an actual lump of the metal at that time. That wasn't produced until 1963, when about 10 grams of pure promethium were refined from nuclear reactor fuel waste. Even today, it's made from that same source. Their 1947 paper, titled The Chemical Identification of Radioisotopes of Neodymium and of Element 61, had to be the least flamboyant announcement of an element's discovery in the history of the world. The announcement didn't even merit a whole paragraph, and really only occupied four words, and of Element 61. Promethium was the last of the rare earths discovered. In addition to fission, it can also be produced by bombarding neodymium-146 with neutrons. Neodymium-146 becomes neodymium-147 when it captures a neutron. Neodymium-147, with a half-life of 11 days, decays into promethium-147 through beta decay. But promethium is also radioactive with a half-life of 2.6 years. It also decays by emitting a beta particle, becoming samarium-147. Samarium-147, with an incredibly long half-life of 100 billion years, decays into neodymium-143 by alpha particle emission. We can end here because neodymium-143 is stable, as far as we can tell. On a nationalistic side note, Promethium was the first element in this series of videos discovered in the United States. The next were the series of elements discovered at the Lawrence Radiation Lab in Berkeley in the 1940s and 50s. Of course, U.S. scientists have been collaborating on many other recent discoveries made in other countries. One obvious one was Tennessine. Element 117, synthesized by an American-Russian collaboration in Dubna, Russia, hence the Russian flag. The name Tennessine was chosen because the American scientists were from Oak Ridge National Laboratory in, you guessed it, Tennessee. Marinsky, Glendinin, and Coriel proposed the name Prometheum. The spelling was subsequently changed as it was customary to end metallic elements with I-U-M, hence the current spelling. The name was derived from Prometheus, the titan in Greek mythology who stole fire from Mount Olympus, bringing it down to humans to symbolize both the daring and possible misuse of mankind's intellect especially prescient since the three physicists were working on the Manhattan Project to produce the first atomic bomb. Before the true discovery in 1945, there were false discoveries and subsequent announcements giving the element other names. In 1926, Italian chemists made a disproved discovery and wanted to call it Florentium after the city Florence. Also in 1927, chemists at the University of Illinois wanted to name their attempt Illinium. Someone, probably using a cyclotron, wanted to call it Cyclonium, though I can't figure out who wanted to use that name. There is a company called Chemistry, spelled with a K, who makes soft skateboard wheels with the name Cyclonium. And finally, our three physicists at Oak Ridge Lab, remember it was called the Clinton Laboratory, wanted to call it Clintonium. I'm sure you'll agree we ended up with the best choice. Promethium belongs to a row of elements known as the rare earth metals, or lanthanides. 
The row in green is called the lanthanides because lanthanum is the first element in this row. Promethium is the fifth element in this periodic table extension. Technically, both scandium and yttrium are also included in this group since they're both members of the same periodic table column. The entire two rows below the main periodic table actually fit in the two spaces after barium and radium. But if we display the table in this fashion, it becomes too long and unwieldy. Publishers don't appreciate this aspect ratio in a table or diagram. It makes it difficult to fit aesthetically in a book or on a poster, even if it's more technically accurate. Because promethium must be manufactured inside reactors and then purified, it tends to be a pricey element. One source puts the price of promethium at a hefty $460,000 per kilogram. Gold is only about $62,000 per kilogram at the time this program was made in 2022. By the way, what you see here is allegedly a large lump of promethium, but I can't find confirmation of that. Having said that, you can find anything online. Here is an Indian website that is claiming to sell promethium for 250,000 rupees per kilogram, which converts to a little over $3,100 per kilogram. That's a real deal. I note here that rubidium on the same page is selling for 2,000 times as much, and that they're using Theodore Gray's graphic. Something's wrong here. Normally at this point in the presentation, we talk about the proportions of the element we find in the universe, the sun, meteorites, the Earth's crust, oceans, and us compared to all the other elements. But because there is no stable promethium in the universe, that discussion is moot. More on what we know about the unstable forms in a few slides. Suffice it to say, unless you're running a nuclear reactor in your garage, have set off an atomic bomb recently, or live near large natural deposits of uranium, you won't encounter promethium. As a side note, Though there's probably no promethium on Earth, there does appear to be some up in the sky. In 1970, astronomers found promethium by looking at the spectrum of a star in the constellation of Andromeda. This is a variable star called HR465, or GY Andromeda. This star is probably too dim to be seen with the naked eye at magnitude 6.27, even in a dark sky. It's a very hot type B star located 460 light years from Earth. Given that promethium has a short half-life, as we'll see in a couple slides, this star must be manufacturing promethium continuously. How cool is that? So let's talk about those radioactive forms of this episode's element. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same, 61 protons for promethium, but there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes, and they're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different masses. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 38 known isotopes of promethium. And as I mentioned, of these 38, there are no stable non-radioactive isotopes. All of them are radioactive. This is the second unstable element we've encountered in the periodic table with no stable isotopes surrounding it. The other being element 43, technetium, the yellow square. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek isos, meaning same or equal, and topos, meaning place, since all these various forms of promethium occupy the same place in the periodic table, the red square. Of the isotopes of promethium, these are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. More on half-life in the next slide. The longest promethium half-life is promethium-145, with a half-life of only 17.7 years. With such short half-lives, you can see why it's so rare. 
it has to be made, and then only sticks around for a short time, at least compared to the age of the Earth and the universe. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any of the isotopes from the previous slide. You'll see why I chose 1,024 atoms. Hint, it's a power of 2, and we're going to be doing a lot of divisions by 2. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Promethium has a medium density at 7.26 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, water has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter. I've put up more densities for you here. You can see that Promethium is a tiny bit less dense than iron at 7.89 grams per cubic centimeter. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When I do this talk with an actual audience, I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself, but we'll have to wait to do this until we're back face to face. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, to magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, promethium's density is 7.26 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle between titanium and iron, but fairly close to iron. Promethium's melting point is 1,042 degrees Celsius, or 1,908 degrees Fahrenheit. It boils at a fairly high 3,000 degrees Celsius, or 5,432 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a full 1,958 degrees C above its melting point. Quite a difference. If we compare the size of the promethium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The promethium atom is almost 3.5 times the size of hydrogen. Those two outer electrons are held fairly loosely, and this is a feature of all the rare earth elements. By the way, a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. Atoms are very small. Here are atom sizes sorted from largest, cesium on the left, to smallest, helium on the right. Promethium has the 21st largest size atom of all the elements. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. Promethium has a very complicated set of bright lines across the spectrum. As I mentioned previously, Promethium's spectrum has been detected in some distant star's light, but not in the sun. And you'll probably never see its spectrum here on Earth because of its short half-life. Let's take a look at a few applications of this rare earth element. Aside from its largest use in research, as you may expect given the fact that Promethium must be made and the cost of making it is about half a million dollars per kilogram, the real world applications are few, but there are a couple we can discuss. Like the old watches that were painted with phosphor paint containing radium, you could do the same with Promethium. The beta radiation makes the phosphors in the paint glow. This is a sealed glass disc containing Promethium-147 with phosphors that glow on their own in the dark without being charged with light like most glow-in-the-dark material we're familiar with. It was also used on compasses so one could navigate in the dark when necessary. 
given that this isotope of promethium has a half-life of only 2.67 years, these markers and watches and compasses lose half of their brightness in that time. Here's a diagram of an atomic battery that uses promethium as its power source. The promethium is well shielded in the center. Just like the glowing promethium disk you saw on the previous slide, here the beta emissions cause a phosphor to glow. The light from the glowing phosphor is then turned into electricity with a photocell, similar to a solar cell that you may have on your roof or in your patio lights. This essentially turns radioactivity into electricity. This battery would have a useful life of about five years because of Promethium's short half-life. Pacemakers must be implanted in your chest. As such, it was thought that having a nuclear battery that would outlast you might be a good idea. No need to open you up and give you a fresh battery. Promethium was used to power some early pacemakers, but most, like the one here, were powered with plutonium. This particular pacemaker was sawn open and the plutonium battery removed before being added to the collection at the Oak Ridge Health Physics Museum. The government takes plutonium very seriously. Here are more nuclear pacemakers. Obviously, these were important to keep track of. Most of these contain less than three curies of plutonium. That sounds like a small amount, but it's actually a sizable amount of radioactive material. Most ionization smoke detectors in your home contain one microcurie, usually of the element americium, not promethium. These pacemakers contain material three million times as active. The beta particles given off by promethium-147 have a specific energy and hence a specific penetrating power. Placing an object between a source and a detector absorbs an amount of beta radiation that depends on the thickness of that material. This allows a nice contact-free method of continuously measuring the thickness of films during the manufacturing process to keep that thickness constant. This is one of those thickness gauges. Promethium shows promise as a portable x-ray source. Promethium can emit x-rays during its beta decay. Unlike this classic x-ray tube that requires high voltage and water cooling, a promethium x-ray source is just a lump of the element that naturally gives off x-rays. No power or cooling required. Much simpler, except for the fact that you have to deal with a relatively large radioactive source. This isn't a problem in most industrial applications. Promethium may also become useful as a heat source to provide auxiliary heat and power for space probes and satellites. What you see here is a fairly large lump of plutonium glowing red hot only because of its radioactivity. These are used to power spacecraft and form the heart of a radioisotope thermoelectric generator or an RTG that turns heat into electricity. RTGs are useful when your spacecraft is too far from the sun for practical solar power, or when your power budget calls for more power than solar panels can supply. Both the Curiosity and Perseverance Mars rovers use these types of generators. One last possible use of Promethium is as a starter in fluorescent lamps. When the lamp is first turned on, tungsten filaments at each end of the tube heat up and vaporize the liquid mercury in the tube. However, the mercury gas is still composed of neutral atoms and won't conduct electricity through the lamp. We need some ions, charged pieces of atoms. A tiny bit of radioactive promethium on the tips of those wires you see, above the filament, provides just such ions, giving the electric current some free charges to get the current flow started. As you've probably already surmised, your body does not use promethium, and it has no known biological functions. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about promethium. Instability, radioactivity, lanthanide bad boy. 
In the next program in this series, we'll examine the next of the rare earth elements called samarium. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about Prometheum.